Uh, I'm Tony Sheridan, President and CEO of the Chamber of Commerce of Eastern Connecticut. It's our honor to be hosting this important discussion today. Part of the Chamber's mission is to promote a regional identity and act as an inclusive voice of business for all populations in the region. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the chair of our board, uh, Dr. Mary Ellen Jorkowski. Mary Ellen, thank you so much for taking the time out today. Come on and take it from here. First of all, I want to say welcome to everyone in this room. I'm delighted to serve as the moderator for Women in Leadership panel today. I think it's very, very important to support women in leadership, and I also appreciate the men who are in this room. Incidentally, it's important to know that the chamber has a board that is 50% male and 50% female. So out of equity, we really try to have both viewpoints at our board meetings. We have four accomplished women here who have diverse experiences in varying kinds of leadership roles. I have a series of questions I'd like to ask each of the panelists. And so we'll start with Alexandra. What ins inspired you to pursue your leadership role? So the very simple answer is that when I was working in real estate, I was working as a developer of apartment buildings. And as anyone here who has worked on these many developments that are going up in New London, which is very exciting, as anyone knows, it's just a huge team effort with a lot of private sector folks, but a lot of public sector folks. The, people from the city are often working as hard on getting a new building built as the people who are going to own it and financially benefit from it more. And I just remember thinking that the people that were on the other side of the table from me were extremely impressive. They were getting government salaries, which is not, you know, we don't compensate people appropriately, I think, for what they do at, at the municipal level. And they were working harder than I was, and they, I just found them extremely impressive, and I thought I would like to be on that side of the table someday, working for a city or a state in this case, this I landed in the state, uh, but I want to be working for, the, for something other than my bottom line, for something that's a little bit bigger than that. It was really about the mission. Like, what's the mission and what is the change that not just impacts one people, that can impact multiple people, that can then take themselves out into the world and make a difference? So for me, anything that I've done or like to do is about, first, a mission. Like, I'm very mission-driven. And then with the attitude, especially at Mitchell, where we are about diversity of all kinds, but especially learning equity. And for me, at this time, and this place is just so important to hear the voices and the brain waves and thoughts of so many. So that's really, for me, what inspired uh, my, my venture here in New London, Connecticut in general, and in Mitchell College. So thanks. Very, very engaging answers from the both of you. Um, I have to admit that when I began working for myself in my 20s, I didn't plan on becoming a leader. That I first just began doing the best work that I could and as a result, the leadership process came along as responsibilities in doing that work. I also, I also have to admit that every day, I feel more obligated to do work about being a better leader. That especially over the past three years, that the process is something that's changing for anyone who has those level of responsibilities. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That's very different about being a leader currently. So if I had to look back at my 20-year-old self, and compared to where I am right now, in many ways, I'm doing the same work I was doing then. And that's perfectly OK. <laughs> so I would have to say I share very similar thoughts to my fellow panelists, mission um, and impact. And for me, it actually started, I'm a daughter of a police officer. And I was really grew up in an atmosphere of everything you do is for public service. And after law school, I actually had the opportunity to serve in the Rhode Island State House. And I served as Deputy Chief of Staff for then Governor Raimondo, now Commerce Secretary. And in that role, I was seeing firsthand the effects and impacts of climate change. And I was seeing it as a Rhode Islander, but I was also seeing the same impacts that we were facing in Rhode Island we're facing here in Connecticut, we're facing in Massachusetts, and we're facing all in New England. 
And I would get calls constantly from business owners that would say, Nicole, because of the extreme storms, my business has to close more than ever. Or we now need new resources because of the extreme heat or the weather impact. And so in that role, I really started to learn more about the clean energy transition. I learned more about where we need to go in order to make sure that we're meeting, you know, Connecticut has amazing climate change goals, Rhode Island has amazing climate change goals, so does Massachusetts. This New England region is really driving progress in that area. And I felt for me, I want to be a part of that progress. And so how can I use my skills to be a part of, you know, driving this clean energy transition? And it, it ended up, I did leave public service. And I would tell you, I, public service was and is a calling, but I wouldn't have left if it wasn't for a mission and impactful company. And so that definitely drove me to the different aspects of leadership responsibility that I've taken through the course of my career. Uh, and for me, it was energy and climate, but I would say for the folks in this room, you know, what, what speaks to you, what drives you, what is your internal mission or impact, and then that, to, to me, has led me to my leadership roles. How do you cultivate a strong and supportive team culture? Allow people to uh, be a part of the process, uh, transparency and communication, and, and, and really being able to consider various different views and ideas and thoughts, and then collectively come together um, to support that. I mean, I really believe in pushing people gently to um, risk and to bring in things that are not a traditional way of thinking and being. And then as a community, uh, come to consensus about how we best uh, meet the needs of the various people in that ongoing, I wouldn't say a challenge, but an ongoing opportunity uh, in an ever-changing culture here. So that's pretty much what I do uh, at Mitchell. So team culture will sometimes be about the little things and the big things. So I'll share with you an idea of the little things. Um, Organizations use credit cards all of the time and they build up credit card points for being able to do that. And what we do is we will take our credit card points and we will turn them back over to the team members for things such as anniversary recognitions or birthday recognitions, or when the gas prices were over $4, we converted those to gas cards. So instead of those points sitting or maybe being used for maybe just my personal use, we then turn them back over to the team. So it was the little things. And then the culture will also be about the bigger things. It'll be about when there is a, a loss in their family, how we reunite around those individuals and help them get through those experiences. And in between, they are thinking about how regularly do we get together? How do we see each other? For those of us who follow us on social media, we recently went to a brush and board event together, all the entire team, which was absolutely hysterically playful to watch graphic designers lose control and how they were able to, to, to paint versus control things on their computers. And it gave us an opportunity to be creative together in a way that we will always remember. Okay? Little things, big things, and things that are remembered, right? I would also say that it is really important that your team members feel that they can, they can be listened to and that they're their voice matters. And I think creating a space, sometimes we're so busy and every single day in the morning you get up to go to work and you have a, a to-do list that's a mile long and the, our employees are focused on getting through that to-do list. And doing the work is part of why we're here. But it's also important that there are spaces where folks can raise issues and discuss challenges that they're happening. And one of the things that I try to do is make sure that there's regular check-ins. And sometimes it'll raise something that will actually have such value for the work product, but no, the, the employee wouldn't have brought it up if there wasn't that space to talk about something that maybe is a little bit beyond their normal day to day. So I'd say uh, in my role, it, I think it's extremely important to set a culture of excellence. And people are pretty clear on my team that I have extremely high standards. I don't. It's not like you find that out after you don't do the assignment. You find out really early what the assignment is, and so it shouldn't be a surprise if I'm not thrilled with the fact that the assignment was not done. But I think people appreciate, and, and then I'm huge on recognition when people do go above and beyond or do do good work. Uh, so I, I think of 
how to motivate folks in a certain specific environment that may not be relevant to everyone here, although maybe some of you can relate and motivating with things other than just sort of that tactical money or promotions or titles or this, you have to set a culture of like, we're here to do good work. We also are all, are, we're all paid by the taxpayers. So there's a, there's a real, I feel a real element of obligation to spend all of your money on our salaries very well and that you all get a return on that. And I'm pretty clear with, pretty clear with people up front and then very grateful when they do a good job after. Women are statistically more likely to absorb competing priorities, which may include home and family responsibilities without losing efficiency. How do you balance your personal and professional responsibilities as a female leader? I do the best that I can, right? And there's, there's you know, elements that I have been able to, to carve out or find particular windows of time. I do find that if you make some things a priority, it will happen. You look at me, you may not think that I'm a person who has a home gym, but I actually do. <laughs> I have a display on my wall that has all of my yoga balls mounted in it. And the first thing that everybody comes when they come into the house, it's not my kitchen or my fireplace. They're like, where did you get that yoga ball holder? Right. So you know, you're not going to achieve it every day the same way or perfection all the time. You're gonna do the best that you can. And you need to ask yourself, what is really important what do I really need to find time for? And that's what you will find time for. But please don't beat yourself up if you're not achieving the perfect balance. There's some days you're going to thrive at work and suck at home, right? There's some days you're gonna have everything in the house will be really, really clean and looking great, and you come to your office and it's a train wreck, right? I used to tell my sweetheart, Andy, there are three places in life, my car, my office, and the house. I can keep two of those clean at any time, <laughs> but not three, okay? So just do the best that you can. Thank you. Which direction? Nicole. Here? Nicole. I would completely agree with that. I, I think there's balance makes it seem like there's a possibility to do all and do it all great. And I think you have to give yourself grace because there are times when you're going to be feeling like I'm doing a great job at work but I'm maybe a bad sister, or I'm a mad, bad mom that day, or a bad daughter that day. And then there'll be another day where you're like, okay, I definitely had to, to rearrange some things so that I could be a good sister, I could be a good mom, I could be a good daughter, and work came last that day. And I think we have to give ourselves grace. We gotta try to do the best we can. Uh, and I had a, a mentor of mine say, it's all work all the time, and it's all life all the time, and. It's just doing everything we can all the time. Uh, and that did resonate with me a lot. Um, and a lot of times the worlds merge. And it seems like you're doing work and your personal life and your family life all at the same time. And so my biggest thing is I, don't, I haven't been able to find a balance. And just try to treat yourself like if a friend came to you and said, oh my gosh, I wasn't able to go. I, I had to order pizza instead of making this dinner. Or I had to, and, and the friend came to you with something like that. If it was your friend, you would say, oh my god, of course. Don't worry about that. But sometimes you're harder on yourself than you would be on your friend. And so treat yourself like you would a friend if they were coming to you feeling like I wasn't able to keep all the balls in the air that day. Um, I'm going to go in a more personal cheesy direction if you'll all bear with me a little bit, which is to say pick your partner. The Picking your partner should be, t if it's important to you to continue to have a very intense career throughout your life, and if you think that, that your partner also feels that way, like, that should be the most explicit conversation early on in picking your partner, and I have, uh, I, I, I'm, he's not here so I don't get any credit, but I'm a, my husband is the perfect partner, and so I, I wish he could get this on video, So because I'm usually mean to him at home. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, okay, good, I'm, I, I'm really gonna actually, get, I, need, I need the credit at home. Um, 
but not only pick right and be super explicit up front, like before we got serious at all, I told him I'm not changing my name, I'm working, I'm not barely taking maternity leave, you're gonna have to deal with, I'm not cooking dinner, I know all this about myself. He was on board and then, obviously, and then, but then, and then I continued to like make a lot of demands at home. I feel like sometimes we make demands at work and then society tells us we're not supposed to make the same types of demands at home. And everyone sets up their home life very differently. I'm not here to tell anyone how to do that, but whatever you want, just demand it and um, don't settle and, and do it on and do it on an ongoing basis. Like there, there were years where I felt like I got to the end of the year and I thought, oh, I think we've lost sight of the fact that he wanted X or I wanted Y, and I would re you know, bring it back up as a reminder. These are my demands. Um, so <laughs> um, I, I, I think a little facetious, but actually that is, I, I, I think that's how you got to, society will let us all revert to that when woman does everything, man does less, if that happens to be your home setup. Um, and so you can't, you, you have to fight the uphill battle of not letting that societal wave wash over you and have you accidentally fall into that traditional roles and you gotta, you gotta be pretty, I think, firm on fighting it. Bring it home. I concur with everything my my panel colleagues have said. I, you know, I think I was thinking about um, I'm a dem I'm sort of somewhat demanding, um, so I can understand that. But I remember earlier on um, in my I guess the earliest part of my career, and um, we had a small person at home, and and she was talking about what other mommies do, and I just had to say to her, that's not what your mommy does, <laughs> and this is what your mommy does do. And, and I think what, for me, about balance, I don't even know if it is such a thing, even if you are a full-time mother or father, it's still difficult to balance everything. So my approach is um, continuous improvement about my life, right? So I think one of the things that has been at the forefront of my mind most recently is um, there were a couple of, <laughs> time up, <laughs> and there were a couple of cases that, I don't know if people heard about this, but there were two presidents, um, colleges, uh, one a large university, well actually fairly decent sized institutions, and one person passed away on stage I think it was Temple University, and then another woman, I think it was in Virginia at a community college, passed away some kind of way, and then there was another person. And, and so for me, it, you know, I thought, I gotta choose myself, number one, because if I don't take care of myself sort of physically, uh, and mentally and spiritually, it's never gonna work. So I really try, like I said, hard to own what is true to me and who I am and what I do as a career person and as a, a real person, whatever. Um, but the physical for me is so critical. I can't survive without some form of exercise. It just won't work. Well, let me just tell you this. If I did exercise, you wouldn't like me right now. <laughs> That's a fact. And people can tell when I haven't gotten that. I think also Reflection time, my job as a higher ed president today is, if you've read anything, it's one of the most stressful jobs in the country. And so if I don't have time to download that, like sometimes I download it on my husband Marvin, which isn't good. <laughs> but I do reach out to my mom and other people, but he's the first person that's in the fire line. So it's like you know being able to reflect and get that stuff out of me and then find ways to replenish myself. I met a couple of people who are like, someone's moving to Iverton and someone lives in Old State Brook and uh, someone, um, we talked about Chester. If it wasn't for Old State Brook, Chester, um, Iverton and now my, one of my favorites, which is Deep River, I couldn't even sit up here today. So I have to find ways to get outside of where I work and who I see and what I do and find a place where nobody knows me. I can walk the streets looking tore down, as they say, in the neighborhood. <laughs> with, uh, you know, and, and that is so relieving for me. So I, I just, I would sum it up by saying what all of us are saying is that it, it may, maybe you're out, maybe there's somebody out there and we really want you to stand up so we can crown you that's doing the balance thing right now. But I just say, as women, we just have to continually improve ourselves and make sure that we're taking care of ourselves so that we can do what we're typically known to do, which is take care of so many other people. Diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging have risen to the forefront of priorities for employers in recent years, and deservedly so. How do you, as a leader, prior prioritize these principles? 
if you are a leader and you are in a position where you are hiring, it is on you to make sure that your hiring process is open and it is going to make sure you have a pool of applicants that are diverse. And I will tell you it takes work. It is not something where you're gonna just put out a, a job posting on LinkedIn and you're gonna get the applicant pool that of, a, of diverse candidates, you're just not. And so what I've done is I make sure that we are finding the right places to post, so it's not just LinkedIn, but also going to the network and saying, going to trusted partners who have relationships with communities of different backgrounds and saying, we have this amazing position. We want to make sure we get a diverse pool of candidates. Uh, and it takes a little bit longer. It takes more time. You're going to push your HR teams to do that legwork. But I've seen the results. And I've seen the results in my position within Orsted. I've seen it in government. And I also have had the opportunity to be on nonprofit boards. And we've really made great strides on some of the nonprofit boards that are serving communities of color. And we want to make sure the leadership of these organizations represents the folks that we are serving. And so I do think going that extra mile, taking that extra time, is incredibly important. <clears throat> I would also say, Making a space to have uncomfortable conversations is also really important. And, you know, Orsted, we do a great job of really trying to use our HR team to make sure that we, for the, we're creating a blue economy here. We're creating this new economy. And in the past, when companies have created new economies, they have just hired folks that looked like them. And we don't want to make that mistake in the blue economy. We want to make sure that there is equal opportunity and access. And so we're trying to be really thoughtful about it and we're trying to push the limits. We're trying to push the limits in terms of the companies that we hire because offshore wind, you know, we hire tier one and tier two suppliers. And we're trying to hold them accountable. But then on a, on, a, on a specific basis, I also think making sure in your teams you're creating a space to have uncomfortable conversations. And there are some amazing professionals who will come in if you don't feel comfortable, if you don't feel like you have the tools, who will come in and start to have conversations with your teams so that everyone has a better understanding of like, language is so powerful. The other day I was in a conversation and there was a debate about using the word underserved and what it meant to different folks from different backgrounds. And that word to some folks was really offensive. And then to other folks, they're like, well, isn't this the reality? But if you don't have a trust built in your team to have that conversation to explain why that word might mean one thing to someone and something totally different to another person, it's going to prevent your team from being open and honest and, and pushing the limits in terms of making sure you're creating an equitable future in whatever business you're in. So I would say hiring, to sum it up, hiring is incredibly important. Go the extra mile, take the extra time, and then to figure out ways to support sometimes uncomfortable conversations to really push your team to be more open uh, about the realities. Um, so on the hiring front, the state has very formulaic diversity goals and formulaic in a good way, structured, I guess I should say, structured diversity goals, and they're really good at helping us meet them. So in fact, DECD is uh, disproportionately female, disproportionately people of color. So we've had a lot of those state mechanisms are working. The, the place where I, so I, we get a lot of folks of diverse backgrounds in, and it's really important to me to make sure that they're happy when they get there and they thrive, so I'll focus my comments more on that side of it. And I don't have any secret sauce. I don't think I've cracked the code whatsoever. My one approach that I bring is to, in order to foster those conversations that you're mentioning, Nicole, in order to make sure that people feel like they can say when they're not happy and other that, so that they don't just quit. You know, you want them to tell you they're unhappy so you can fix it. I try to be extremely approachable and casual and authentic at work. I bring all my kids' artwork everywhere. I, when, my, when I have to leave early because my kid is sick, that I don't lie and say, oh, I have a business obligation. It's like, nope, I have an ear infection situation that I have to get to, um, which I think is something my mom was not able to do. She had to always pretend that she was not doing 
female work, you know, she wasn't dealing with kids. So I, I just try to bring, the expression is sort of cheesy, but I just try to bring my whole self to work. Everyone knows exactly who I am. And even if the experience of whoever I'm talking to is a completely different lived experience, I hope that just the fact that I'm very open about my lived experience makes them feel like they can be open about theirs. I'm sure I haven't, as I said, I'm sure I haven't cracked the code, but that has been my uh, my guiding star as it relates to dealing with all these really difficult topics where it's there's no guidebook, you know. Okay, that's always a challenging question, actually. It shouldn't be, but it is. You know, one of the things that I've, ex I'm going to share personal, I've experienced as being a targeted diversity candidate. And, and I, so I've learned from that experience, and certainly at my institution, which is pretty diverse, but it's also diversity in what you see and then what you don't see, and then figuring out the best way to get at that, right? I love how someone mentioned, I think you mentioned, Nicole, um, using like undeserved, you, you know, what the language is. And, you know, we um, talk at Mitchell all the time about not necessarily talking about tolerance, because what is that really about? It's about equality, it's about equity, it's about the voice of many. But I was, when N Nicole was talking, I was writing something down that, that struck me, that's brought something up in my mind other than what I thought I would say, is that the organization has to be ready to receive diverse perspectives, diverse people, ideology, it doesn't really matter what your organizational diverse code is, we have one, what you say you do, but if the organization has not done the work from the top all the way down to the lowest, whatever you call that is, not lowest, it won't work because it's not gonna be welcoming to people. People are not gonna feel like uh, they belong just because someone has a quota to meet. It's like, how do you, how does that work? And I think, uh, my other colleague said, uh, hard conversations, talking about the murky stuff that is embarrassing and tough, but it's very difficult. I always feel like it's very difficult to, to go out here and, and bring someone into a family, a work family, and not be able to really support them. And so I, it takes more than just the color or the, um, let's say sexual orientation it takes so much more than that it's really being able to do the work uh, to try to understand that and i and i also would say um one to my word yeah, i think that's the one thing that i wanted to say in the challenges that, that that we face i'll be straight up with you at our organization is that when people are transitioning right they're transitioning in their life and you know do did we have the right well we didn't initially when i arrived at mitchell have a pronoun policy or like how do we work with students and people who are going through a, a pretty interesting uh, interest but an important transition in our life that they can be identified as such you know whether that's a name tag policy email change and being respectful of that and what i say to all of our employees i've said this for years as a leader i really don't care if you agree with what someone is or not but what I'm always looking for is respect and openness and being able to receive people for whatever they bring to the table. And I think that's just really, really, really important. There's this huge thing about diversity and belonging, but there's so much more work um, that has to be done to really be at that point. So that's, those are my thoughts about that. And I'm looking at the word belonging as being the, the question that's on the table. And I'm thinking about um, one of my art directors, her name is Carissa. Anybody here know my colleague Carissa? She, she uses a wheelchair and, a, and an adorable support dog to be part of our lives. And I have to tell you, I no longer see Carissa's chair. It doesn't even, I don't even see that. I see the president of the Connecticut Art Directors Club. I see a brilliant mind and a brilliant creative spirit. And to me, that's the ultimate definition of the aspect of belonging, where it isn't about any of those issues. But I'm also going to share with you that I am a small business owner. 85% of the chamber, Tony, I think, are individuals with less than 50 employees. Not all of you out there have an HR department or programs that you can turn to. So you need to think about some very clever approaches and relationships that you can build to convey welcome and to convey re relations. I'm looking at my beautiful colleague, Marjorie, and we found each other at CVS, aisle nine. <laughs> True story, right? True story. Right? You have to be open for conversations and open for opportunities. The reason I'm teaching at your college, and it's an honor to do so, is because I knew that the next generation of my employees are going to be in your classroom. 
and that's where I needed to meet them and I needed to invest in them for the potential of joining my team a few years from now. So there's lots of opportunities and solutions. It may not be the same for all of your organizations, but if you seek to help people feel that they belong, that's the hard work, the rest of it will be easier. What are some of the biggest lead challenges you have faced as a woman in leadership? It's, we can't deny that the, the burden of bringing children into the world much more heavily falls upon women, and uh, that is something that I, I when we figure that out, we'll figure a, we'll figure a lot out as it relates to gender equality. But I remember when I was pregnant with my my oldest child and told my boss that I was pregnant, and I said, "But don't worry, I'm going to take a super short maternity leave. I really love this one project that we're working on. I'll be right back. You won't even notice." And he said, "No, don't worry. You won't. You don't know how you're going to feel. There's all these hormones." And my wife thought the same thing, but she never went back to work. So don't worry. Just tell me later, but like, if you don't want to come back, that's totally fine. And I and he was a really good boss and a really nice guy, and he I still have him as a reference on when I on my resume and everything. But um, you know that was really deflating for the whole rest of my pregnancy, and because I knew he didn't think I was coming back, and he stopped giving me new projects because he thought, oh, we'll see when you get back if you want to work on this new project. So that's a very concrete example. I can't say I have a long list of those, but as it relates to um, procreating. Everybody has their own, sets their own path and you make your own decisions, but we should all respect each other's decisions. And I knew what my decision was and I felt like it wasn't respected and people didn't, they undermined my own agency there because they thought, oh, your hormones are going to kick in and you, you have no idea what that's going to be like. So um, I think that's a concrete example of we need to get better about talking about things like that and not just talking about it, but actually giving people the space to procreate in the way that they want. Okay. Um, I was thinking about that question and a couple of things came to mind, but I'll just share the one that's forefront on my mind. Uh, it was really when I was um, not really sure exactly the road I was going to take. Um, after I finished at my, I finished at Syracuse University and I was just deciding, you know, if I'm going to go research, if I'm going to go administration, if I'm going to just teach. And I was really sort of leaning towards uh, the duality of administration and research and then, but I didn't know how, like I didn't know, I wasn't thinking of president, I wasn't even thinking of dean actually, that's what's funny when I think about it now. But I remember someone saying to me, I don't think they really meant anything by it, was that as a woman of color, how difficult it would be for me to sort of, you know, move forward in any form. And you know, I, I didn't think about it, um, I hadn't thought about that in a very long time and it's, but it sometimes, you know, as we we go back and answer the last question, which is a little bit different about uh, diversity. But um, I don't know if that person saw me as being able to ascend ascend to that level. I really don't know. But it just uh, I don't think in the moment that I thought, uh, as a you know person who finished their PhD or whatever, that it was going to be that many challenges. I saw it as door opening. But I I think what they were trying to do was to warn me and for me not to get my hopes up so that I wouldn't be disappointed because there certainly weren't as many people uh, back 20 something years ago getting a PhD in what I was getting it in and was sort of high up in uh, higher education. So that's kind of the one or two things that I can think about. But I've since overcame that thought of that person, so. Very clear. Okay. So, um, this question actually caused me to stall a bit in the, in the questions that were sent. Because if you can imagine as a 23-year-old young woman beginning my own company, my father was Cuban and my mother is Irish, by the way, which explains a lot about me, doesn't it? <laughs> they, you know, they, were, they were married in the 40s, and an Irish woman choosing to marry a Cuban man in the 40s was not commonly heard of. But we didn't really dwell in that space. We didn't think about it as a family. We just moved forward. I'd have to say that um, for every bad experience I had where there was bias against me for whether it was my age or my background, there was a lot higher level of kindness that was offered to me. There were people who wanted to see me succeed, who believed in me. The one that comes to mind is I think of the owner of WICH Radio, where he paid for my leadership program when I was 23 years old to go to, to those classes because he wanted to see me succeed as an agency here locally. So I chose consciously to dwell on those that 
loved or embraced or encouraged me, and I followed that path instead. But I will say there was one bias that was challenging for a while, and it wasn't about um, race or my age. It was about my zip code. And I would walk into meetings and I would say I'm from the Norwich area. I wasn't from Chester, or I wasn't from Glastonbury, or I wasn't from West Hartford as a creative. And they would begin to immediately discount maybe my expertise or my skills or how much I should be paid because I was from the Eastern Connecticut area. So do you know how I overcame that? I succeeded. <laughs> right? 35 years later and I'm a popular choice coming from this portion of the state. They understand the scrappiness of being here. And they're looking for people who think differently outside of those cultures. And so I say to you, if you're challenged, the best way to move forward is to succeed. So I have a, two examples that, that come to mind. One of them is I am still constantly the only female in very many rooms. And there have been times over, you know, I'm, I didn't talk about this, but I'm a lawyer by trade, and so there were times when I was working at the law firm, when I was working in government, and even now, that I'm still the only female in the room. And I will say something, and it will be either dismissed or not acknowledged, and then two minutes later, a male partner will say the exact same thing, and it's looked at as brilliant. And I'm sitting there like, what? Um, and that happens to me constantly, and has happened to me constantly. And <clears throat> it's been really frustrating, and it is something that I've been trying to, in every job that I have, I try to actually find a few allies, and if there are certain rooms that I know I'm gonna be in constantly, I will try to find those allies and say, hey, did you notice that this happened to me? In the, in the future, do you, do you think you could kind of, when I say something, you could um, support what I'm saying if you actually agree with it and highlight it? Um, and it's something I will tell you that I read uh, Michelle Obama's uh, book, and they did this at the White House, actually, because the women in President Obama's administration realized that the same thing that I'm talking about, about being the only female in the room and having their point not acknowledged, actually led them to stop raising the points. And it became a real issue. And so they created kind of an informal buddy system. And so I've tried to learn from that and figure out ways with whatever opportunity that I can create this informal ally system. Uh, and the other thing that I will say, and I was mentioning this to the senator earlier, is so, you know, public service and politics is something that I do a lot, and I have worked a lot in. Um, you know, my dad was a police officer, I wasn't gonna be a police officer, so going into public service or supporting public servants is something that I'm really called to. And there is certainly an all boys network, in an, an old boys network in politics. And one of the things that I'm starting to encounter is there's also a young boys network. <laughs> And so I've actually teamed up with a few of my fellow females that are in politics, and we are s slowly but surely trying to create our own female network in politics. And it can lead to really specific things. Uh, you know, there's a lot of boards and commissions that folks in power get to put and nominate, a, you know, other folks to be on. And those are, can be volunteer boards, they can be paid boards, but they can have a lot of impact in local communities and in state communities. And if the only people that are selecting folks for those boards and commissions are old white men, you're only going to lead to solutions where old white men are continued to be put on those boards and commissions. And so we're really trying informally, there's no like formal group, but to create this network of women so that if we hear that there's a board or, or commission position, we can go to our network and say, hey, would you be interested in that? You'd be great for that. And to really try to make sure there's, again, more diversity in folks that are put on these kind of more political boards and commissions. Uh, and so that's the second example I, I would have. What advice would you give to other women who aspire to become leaders? The day that I wake up and say, I'm the leader, <laughs> it's the day I probably need to leave. You know, I'm the server of this institution because it really is. I think it's 
everybody would agree that when you're leading people, you're really serving them. And I really like to posture that, have that mindset all the time. I think know yourself. I think choose yourself and then find uh, mentors. Don't look around and, and believe that it's somebody else can do it, but you choose yourself and find ways to um, start walking that path. Yeah. I think the the first step in, in becoming a leader is to not really necessarily like begin the conversation with you, not to think about yourself as having to become a leader, but to first think about what your strengths are and where they are most appreciated and where you want to bring those strengths to. As a result of that, you will naturally become a leader in, in your environment. I think as you said very wisely, leadership is also about listening. And I find that I am uh, the best leader when I am listening to what my colleagues or my team members have for advice for me. Um, a leader is not always about the person who is in the forefront and necessarily guiding or directing. A leader is about the person who's listening for the best solutions, wherever they may come from, and applying those solutions to better whatever circumstances. It might be your organization, it might be someone that you're working with, and that is the nature of being a leader. Completely agree with everything that has been said. I would add two things. I would say go towards opportunities that you find rewarding. I think that will be, it will continue to allow you to be in opportunities where you can lead if that's what you want. And then the second thing that I would say is actually just general advice, whether you want to be a leader, you want to be successful in whatever you're doing, and it goes back to the, this concept of networking, but it's a little bit more specific and a little bit more tailored. <clears throat> so when you run, most politicians when they run for office, you might have heard the saying, she's in my kitchen cabinet, he's in my kitchen cabinet. And it's usually this small group of folks that are close to the candidate, they could be friends, they could be family members, they could be former politicians. It's usually a handful that advise the politician throughout the course of a campaign. And when I found out that politicians did this, I said, why can't I do this for life? So I created my kitchen cabinet for life. And so I have a handful, mine happens to be all women, uh, I have a handful of women mentors, some from politics, some from working in clean energy, all different backgrounds. And whenever I have a difficult decision to make, or when I'm thinking about a different job opportunity, or when I'm thinking about something in my, honestly, I, it's career, but also personal, I get my kitchen cabinet together and I talk it through. And it has been so incredibly helpful to have these women, and it's best if you find women who aren't impacted by the decision that you make, or people, it does not have to be women, but if you find people that are not impacted by the decision you're gonna make because they can give you real advice and honest advice, and that has helped me throughout the course of my entire career, knowing I could go to my kitchen cabinet and say, I'm thinking about doing this, what do you think? And get the honest feedback, and at the end of the day, they know I'm gonna make a decision. It might not be to agree or disagree, but having them in my corner always has been incredibly valuable. Uh, I would say finding the right spot to be a leader, and by spot I basically mean job, but um, you know, it, sounds really exciting, you think, oh, someday I want to manage 100 people, someday I want to have a huge team, someday, but none of that is exciting if you're not working on, on the type of product that you want in the type of environment that you want. And so a short story is right out of college, I got what everyone thought was the coolest job out there running a small product line at Ralph Lauren. And everyone thought that must be so, <laughs> that must be so glamorous, that must be so, but it was a really horrible place to, you know, I, not the whole company, I'm not, but just this, this one job was not a good job. It was a really bad, a really unsupportive team, very, um, just a, I, I was, I had to, sort of get, get, do pump up music to go into work every day. <laughs> the point is from the outside, working in that environment seems so glamorous, so cool. It's a company that sounds great. It's a product that sounds amazing. But you gotta find the fit between both the environment and the company and then the function and the culture. So 
you've got to mash those two things up. And sometimes a company that seems like maybe it has, like, like the state of Connecticut, maybe that seems like a really boring place to work to some people. Um, maybe people think, and I love what we do, I love our product, I love the culture. Um, and so I'm, I'm sort of meandering, I apologize. But you've got to find the right fit for you, not just what looks good on paper, what looks good on your resume, what you thought would be. It's got to be the right function where you actually like the function of what your company does, what your job does, and also the right environment and then then the all the success that we've been talking about that sort of comes you know the, I think someone said earlier the best way to fight all this is to just succeed but you're not going to do that if you've set yourself up for failure by picking the wrong opportunity for some reason um, so find the perfect job for you and then it will you'll, you'll start rising the ranks and people will want to follow you because they'll see that you're excited about your job and they'll just want to keep going on that path with you thank you for letting me come back to it real quick um, I wanted to share with you is that you are actually already leaders. And I wanted to inspire you to think about yourself in that way. You may not say to yourself, I'm aware that I am influencing others, but you absolutely are. Marjorie influences me every day. Right? And to be aware about, about as you go through life, what you're doing, you are actually already leader. There's individuals who are admiring you, who are watching you, and who are learning from you. Thank you very much. How do you foster innovation and creativity within your team? Okay, I breathe. No. <laughs> so, um, well, this is, you know, innovation and creativity is um, a 24-7 environment within our culture at Miranda Creative. And it is an aspect that happens for projects that we're working on and every element within what we do. If you come to our building, you will see that we have these amazing flower boxes and decorations and things that are there all of the time. Because we know that our team members who are coming to work every day need to feel good about their environment and when they're there. We also look at investing in each other for challenges or for creative elements or things that we need to grow and we need to expand as a community. Very specifically, it's about making sure that there's still joy wrapped around the work that we're doing. I used to have a, a mug at my desk. It was filled with pens and it said, deadlines amuse me. <laughs> and there was a jar next to it that said, ashes of dead deadlines. Right? <laughs> because it was a, it's a constant deadline environment. And as a result of that, there can be a lot of stress or pressure around the process. And at some point, you feel like you're not doing the most creative aspect of work. I asked my team once a month to go back and look what they've done and look what they've accomplished. And that brings forth a place of pride and joy, and that inspires more. It's important to make sure your team knows and to make sure you're building an environment where even in the midst of chaos and challenges, the idea that might, when you first hear it, might say, hmm, does that is, is, might make you pause? You give the extra 30 seconds to hear the person out because it could might it may lead to a solution that is exactly what you need, uh, and so I would say even in times of challenge, even in times of crisis, even in times of chaos, to really make sure you as leaders, you as team members, are being open to a creative or innovative um, idea that's proposed by someone on your team. Uh, so I feel like I've said a lot of tongue-in-cheek things about working in the state government, but we're not known for innovation, typically, state, state employees. But I, I have to challenge folks all the time to think outside the box, and that's basically what innovation is, right? So I, I think the main approach I have is to make sure we're always outcome fo focused as opposed to process focused. A lot of times I'll have a, we'll have a challenge that we need to we need to get funding to a certain organization or we need to partner with a small business that and and the answer that my team will say is oh we can't do that because of the xyz process that's not how we've done it before and so i'll frequently just throw it back to them and say okay 
the, we are going to get this funding to this organization because it's the right thing to do. It's going to help all these businesses. So instead of can't, 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 let's pretend that that's definitely happening. And now let's just figure out how we get from here to there. Let's try to think of, did we do a different contract? Was it, can we use the, the PSA contract instead of the capital projects contract? I know I'm not making this sound any sexier than that, but um, you know, between all the different contracts, which one should we pick? Uh, but that's, that's sort of the, it's the, okay, we're going here, and let's not say, no, 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 we can't get there because of process. Let's instead say, how are we gonna get there? And it has, there's been a lot of things in the three and a half, four years I've been at DCD. We've done a lot of time, we've done a lot of things for the first time, and people, when I first suggested whatever that thing was, looked at me like I was crazy, and I said, well, work with me. Let's pretend it's not crazy. Let's get there. So I think that sort of outside the box thinking and being excited about any contract, many contracts, uh, you gotta get people there even if they're sort of stuck in the old ways. They are everything, but um, <laughs> I, 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 I jotted something down. Um, um, you know, because I, 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 I had, you know, out of the box thinking, but I usually say to our team, you know, mission alignment is key, but give me the most uh, creative thing that you can think of. What can we do that's different? And then uh, I wrote down, do things in a different manner, um, aligning with our mission. And honestly, what, what works best for me is that I just, like we may have a particular goal, objective, something that we're trying to get to. It's like I don't really matter the pathway. You don't steal anything, hurting the body. You know, there's certainly um, uh, guide post to that guide. But the best work comes when I am not in the process, the innovation. It's just so let's people actually come up with things. It's almost like someone taught me. I used to say throw a macaron on the wall and they said, no, it's throwing spaghetti to test if it's done. So I'll say, why don't you throw some of the pasta <laughs> on the wall of ideas and then um, come up with it. And then I you know, let people do what they do best and it, it, it works for us and I, I like that. I like just sort of putting it out there in terms of what we, where we need to go. Like we, we have to grow students, but we can grow students in 500 different ways. I'm going to leave you people and let you figure out how to do that, and then I'll come back, and then you can tell me what your ideas are. And I think people really like that because they feel the freedom of uh, owning that time and being able to come with their ideas. So that's pretty much what I do. How do you handle criticism or negative feedback as a leader? I think when negative feedback comes from a place where I know that maybe it's not the best intentions or from a competitive place or from a place of someone who doesn't want to see me grow and doesn't want to see me succeed, I tend to try my absolute best to see if there's any glimmer of, is, is there something in that that I actually should take? Even though I don't want to hear it, even though it's negative, even though I don't trust where it's coming from, is there anything in there that I should think through and say, can I change the way I do something so that I'm a better leader for my team? I'm a better supportive member of my team. I do try to find value in whatever criticism or negativity is sent my way. But the other thing I really try to do is if it is just negative and negativity for the sake of negativity, I really try as hard as I possibly can to not let it stay with me. And I think as women, sometimes we're thinking over, did we say the right thing? And if someone comes up and says something negative, it makes you overthink it again and overthink it again and overthink it again. And to the best of my ability, and I don't always do this perfectly, but if someone is saying something negative, negatively and it's not something where I can grow from it or where there's it was an added value, I do try the best I can to put it to bed and move forward because I've got work to do and I don't have time for negativity for the sake of negativity. Um, I would say one, one important thing when it comes to feedback is just knowing yourself and how you receive it. And so it's been long and I've been around for long enough and I've had a pattern where I know that I re react badly right away to feedback. Like I, I, I know I know I know it's coming, I can feel it happening, and I 
gotten this far in life realizing I might not be able to change that. And so sometimes I'll just, I actually got um, feedback yesterday from my head of HR that he thought I was, I should have handled the situation differently. And I said to him in the moment, I was like, Kyle, I'm going to warn you. I'm not going to, like, the next three minutes, I'm going to behave a little badly. Like, I'm not going to say the right things in the next three minutes, and sorry. And then, so I just sort of was really defensive for three minutes. I was like, well, that's ridiculous, because I get it, get it, get it, get it, get it. And he sat there and just sort of, like, it was actually not awkward, because I had told him it was coming. And, um, and then I calmed down. And this is something I learned in my marriage, too, and I think... There's a lot of you know. There's a lot of parallels in home and and work life, um, and so I try to. Yeah, it'd be great if I could just blissfully with a smile receive feedback, but I've kind of come to terms with the fact that that's not going to happen. And so instead, giving other people the tools to to basically have the situation end up in a end up in a positive place in the end. And I think people appreciate self awareness. Like I don't think he was upset by those three minutes because he had he had some warning. So he's like looking at his phone, you know, <laughs> waiting for me to be done. And I do the same thing with my husband. I'm like, I, I can be honest with you. You're never going to give me negative feedback where I'm not going to kind of like be cranky about it. But I, I promise you, I'll always come around. I'll take that minute to to find the glimmer, to find the thing that is useful, and I'll come back around and I'll hopefully apologize for having been a little nasty in the meantime. And then I will genuinely say thank you, and I will genuinely take whatever it is. So you gotta um, you gotta realize it's hard. I don't think it's it's pretty hard to be perfect at taking feedback, and so be kind be be kind to yourself and be honest with the people around you. I agree with that. <laughs> I love the fact that she warns people. I really like that. <laughs> Thank you for that. I, would say that I just expect it to be, first of all, I think it's challenging, right? Because sometimes you don't want to hear what someone has to say about you, <laughs> unless it's really good things. But um, I think um, over my career, in my career, I've accepted as part of the job, you know, and there's always some truth in it. Sometimes, it, you know, I, I don't know, always know what the truth is. So I just, my goal is just to listen. And uh, sit on my hands sometimes and not, you know, or either, you know, not say anything, but to sort of take that in stride as a way to find out what's the, really the truth in this. And especially if it's how I may have treated someone or what I may have said, I'm, I'm very cognizant of that. But uh, one of the things that I tell myself a lot is that it's probably not personal. It would be any president in this job or any, and in my old day as a provost, I would say, take me out of the job, put in another person and it would be that person dealing with these kinds of issues. So it's it's one of those things that I just say it's part of the job, you know, what can I do to change and be better, continuous improvement, and then uh, try to move forward. So a true story just happened here a few minutes ago. I tried to write a note for myself about um, criticism and negative feedback to saying that no one is harder on, on me than myself, and neither one of the pens would write. <laughs> So I think that might be a little message from the universe not to be so hard on myself. <laughs> um, in the particular role as an agency principal, um, uh, negative feedback will come in two different silos or directions. One will be on myself as a leader of the organization, and the other would be myself on leading a creative team and the outcome of that work. So the first thing I had to look at is, is was the criticism about me as an individual, me as a leader, coming from both perspectives, or was it about the outcome of the work that was happening based on my leadership? So those are two things I first have to analyze. Every single time it happens, I say to myself the word mirror. I want to first look in the mirror. What is my role in this process? What did I do differently? What should I be doing differently? And when I begin from that perspective, it allows me to then sort of look at ownership levels around it from that side of it. So I first begin by analyzing myself, looking in a mirror, understanding the circumstances that might be influencing it, and addressing what I can as external causes or internal causes. The wisdom that you have shared has just been profound. So please know that on my behalf and the behalf of the audience, we really appreciate your time. We really appreciate your honesty. Um, and we appreciate the realness of each of you.